Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, everybody. My name is Angie, and I'm an alcoholic. First of all, I want to thank the committee for uh, for having me here. Uh, this is a great hotel, and uh, I'm just really glad to be in Nashville. When I was younger, I always wanted to come here and, and be a country singer because I had uh, saw Charlie Pride. You know, do you guys remember Charlie Pride? Yeah, I just kind of wanted to go up to him and go, Charlie, good idea. You know. <laughs> but um, I'm really pleased to be here. Um, and always glad to come and, and be with people that I love and I respect and speakers that I heard when I was just a baby in this thing. And, uh, you know, that you guys got some dynamite speakers this uh, this weekend, and I'm really glad to be here. Cliff, it's always a pleasure to see you, and I'm excited about hearing you. And uh, Bobby C. Is, is my brother in this process, and Lou and Linda have been like my, uh, my parents, and I've kind of watched them and, and kind of... Uh, just learned a lot from people, but I'm really, like I said, I'm really, really pleased to be here. I uh, will tell you that I, for many years, have worked on this fear that I've had of speaking in front of a lot of white people. <laughs> so I want to thank you, Nashville, very much for bringing that all back to me. <laughs> I want to say hi to my my brother and my sisters, power to the people. <laughs> we can have our own little meeting later on if you'd like. I love Alcoholics Anonymous, and the buck stops here for Angie. You see, um, I have nowhere else to go but here, and I don't know that I'd want anywhere else to go. But I have been properly horrified and thoroughly convinced that I'm an alcoholic, and that when I put alcohol in my system, what happens to me doesn't happen to my brother. My brother drinks a beer and he goes to work. And I, and I drink a beer and I'm on the evening news. And that, <laughs> that's the difference between he and I. I am originally from Greenville, South Carolina. And uh, thank you, so some of my relatives here. <laughs> thank you, good seeing you, sis. Um, and uh, back home we lived, uh, on a red clay road in a little white house and uh, we got our water out of wells and um, we went to church every Sunday. Uh, life was extremely simple. It was very, very simple. I have a brother that's older than me and I have a sister that's younger than me. And I'm from a family of Baptist ministers. And all we did was go to church. And I'll tell you what, when I came into AA, I had a huge problem with the God concept. Um, especially, you know, I was kind of cool with it until the basket passed. <laughs> and I thought, here we go. And just like I thought. Just like church. And uh, But um, I had flaming red hair and freckles growing up, and, and nobody else in my family did. Imagine that. And my brother, you know, brothers, you got to love them. And uh, he told me that uh, I looked the way that I did because the mailman was my daddy. So whenever I would see the mailman... I would go, Daddy! And I would run up to him, and he'd put his arms around me and pat me on my head and tell me how cute I was. And thank God for Alcoholics Anonymous and the steps and the book and sponsorship. I, I found out that that, that kind of turned out to be a little pattern for me, actually, that if you just put your arms around me and pat me on the head and tell me how cute I was, we were basically married. I, um, you know, and then six months down the line, I'm going, what would you say your last name was again? <laughs> so I, uh, uh, my, my dad, he was traveling back and forth. He had, he had got a job transfer, and we're traveling back and forth, and he finds us a place to live, and he also found him a girlfriend, and he moved uh, with her, and that left uh, my mother to raise my brother and sister and myself. And I will tell you that when I first got sober, my mother was my biggest resentment. I really, truly felt like if she would have tr uh, treated me the way she did my sister and brother, that I would not be in the predicament I'm in called alcoholism. That surely things would be different if she would have just treated me differently. But, you know, I talk about that, and, and uh, 
My mother is uh, suffering from mental illness, and she doesn't believe in taking medication. And, uh, and my mother's having a rough time. And I'm really thankful for Alcoholics Anonymous because what you guys taught me was how to be there for my mother. That my mother's got her own set of problems that really don't have anything to do with me. And that I'm to be there. See, it's easy for me to go to meetings and empty ashtrays and clean off tables. But can I be of service to my mother in her time of need without expecting, because she's my mother, to do certain things for me? And my mother told me something in her, mental, in her, in her moments of uh, clarity. She told me that when the nurse gave me to her when I was a baby, that the nurse said, you look out for this one because she's going to touch people's lives. She said, I knew what they were talking about when you were drinking because you most certainly touched our lives. <laughs> she said, but I have no idea. I had no idea what you're doing now. My mother got to come and hear me, uh, you know, speak. And, uh, and you know, um, I just, can I get a Kleenex? Because I don't want to electrocute myself up here. <laughs> Because I'm going to cry. That's just the way it goes. <laughs> Thank God. Thank God. So usually some al comes running down the road. Thank you. <laughs> With a whole handful of Kleenex. <laughs> Thank you very much. Oh, yeah. Come from nowhere. <laughs> Flip out a box. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Where was I at? Ah, oh, my mom. So, so my mother uh, decided that because she cleaned bathrooms for a living down south, she decided that when we got up to Cincinnati, Ohio, that she wanted us to have a good education, and she sent us to Catholic schools. And my mother worked two jobs as a waitress to send both of her children to Catholic schools. We weren't allowed to say certain words. We had to speak proper English. My mother always told us that we had a strike against us because we were black. I don't think that she meant that in a negative way. She meant that so that we could work harder to be everything that we could be. And uh, so my mother decided to send me to uh, St. James of the Valley Catholic School. And now I was a red-haired, freckle-faced girl with a white blouse and a plaid skirt and black and white Spaldings and... <sighs> And I got beat up on a regular basis because it just did not look normal. It didn't look normal. You know what I mean? I had a real, real huge afro, and it just did not look normal. And, I, and I'm, I'm okay with that today because if I saw somebody that looked like me, I would, you know, probably run up and hug them. But you know what I mean? It just didn't look normal. And there was this girl named Squeaky. Squeaky was like 6'10 in the fifth grade. And, you know, she had her little posse that she hung out with. And, and uh, one day they stoned me on the way home from school with and I, I listen to all the almonds. Oh, she got stoned. <laughs> Did you hear her, Marge? She got stoned. Um, no, I didn't mean that I smoked weed. I meant that they actually threw stones at me. And uh, so I ran in the house and I told my mother, I said, whew, I'm glad I made it in the house, Mama. They were stoning me. And she goes, you know, Angela, and I knew when she sounded like this, it was always problems. She said, you know, Angela, at some point, you're going to have to learn how to stand up for yourself. So I want you to go out there and you stand up to Squeaky. Or you stay in here and uh, get the butt whooping I'm going to give you. And I knew what my mother's butt whoopings felt like. I only knew what Squeaky's appeared to be. And so I went outside and I told her, I said, my mother said I'm supposed to fight you. And uh, she said, well, come on then. So <laughs> And I closed my eyes and I reached up. I got her right here. Oh, my God. I could not believe it. Happiest day of my life. <laughs> Happiest day I had fought the giant. Happiest day of my life. Now, I will tell you that once I hit her, she never budged. Uh, so uh, I remember looking at her going, you're about to kill me, ain't you? So she gave me the big beat down. But what I realized was I got this thing called alcoholism that makes me uh, uh, forget what I, I'm supposed to remember and remember what I'm supposed to forget. And... Uh, 
I didn't remember the fact that she beat me down, but I most certainly remember the fact that I hit her. And from that point on, I became a, a boxer. And I fought everybody, all the way up into the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. I was known as the knockout queen. I fought every single box. But you know, you get start working some steps and talking to your sponsor, and you have to get honest. You know, and they call me the knockout queen because every time somebody hit me, they knock me out. So I, uh, so I, uh, uh, that was the story of my, my boxing. And uh, my mother had got a, a job working for a company called Avon. And uh, on my 12th birthday, she came to school and picked me up and took me to our first home because we were in the ghetto when we moved there. And she took us to our first home, and it was in an all-white neighborhood. We were the first African-American family to move into this uh, part of the neighborhood. And so from 13 to probably 19, I wasn't even black. I, um, <laughs> I listened to uh, Bob Seger and the Silver Bullet Band, and uh, my favorite girl group was Heart. And... <laughs> The first concert I ever went to was Led Zeppelin in 1979. <laughs> and I remember I was at the uh, Ted Nugent Foreigner concert, and uh, Foreigner was, you guys remember that song? Feels like the first time. Man, and I was standing in that Coliseum, and Foreigner was singing, it feels like the first time. And I remember looking around thinking, I'm the only black person in here. <laughs> It feels like the very first time. I said, I am a legend in my own mind. <laughs> and, and from that point on, things changed for me. And you know, the weird thing about alcoholism is when I looked at you, I know that you thought I was black, but I thought I had a secret because you really didn't know that I was white. <laughs> so I was the smart one. And that's, that's why I don't drink. Um, <laughs> so I hung out in, in this all-white neighborhood. I hung out with these five girls, and uh, five white girls, and you know, I could not believe it. Their parents told them, Rebecca, your father and I have been talking, and we feel as if you're going to drink. We would like for you to do it at home. And I remember looking at them going, what did you say? Rebecca said, we can drink at home. Our parents don't want us to drink out. And I thought, my God, that is the closest family I have ever seen in my life. I mean, you just go in, the, you know what I mean? I remember going, you know, home to my mother going, you mind if I have a beer? And, <laughs> and she just hugged me and said, not in this lifetime, dear. And I hung out with these girls. And, uh, you know, I don't mean any disrespect. I I'm a member of Alcoholics Anonymous, but... You know, it's some drugs in my lead. You know, shoot me. <laughs> and if you don't like, you know, my story, uh, where's B? Raise your hand, baby. Tell her. <laughs> don't tell me. Tell her. So it's a couple in there, but I had, they told me to tell my story, and that's what I'm doing. But I, you know, smoked a little marijuana. It wasn't, you know, couldn't deal with that, you know smoked it, ate everything that was in the freezer that had been there, you know, that had been there for about 20 years, you know what I mean, and, and uh, trying to convince people of how fresh it was, and, uh, you know, did a little acid, it got me a mental health diagnosis, and, uh, but I have to tell you guys this, I, uh, my, my friend Rebecca had, uh, gave me these two little pills one night, and, and, uh, she, uh, told me to take one, but naturally I took two, and, uh, and, uh, she said that things were going to get colorful. She said, things are going to get real pretty. And I love pretty things. <laughs> so we're driving down the road, and they decide that they would like to get something to eat. And I'm driving. And uh, it was a very interesting trip. And so I pull into the uh, drive through and it really begins to take effect. And, uh, and so uh, they told me to go up to the, the little yellow box. And, um, and I went up to the little yellow box, and... Uh, Somebody starts talking. I was appalled. I could not believe it. What you want? What you want? That's what he asked me. What you want? No, what do you want? No, keep asking me what I want. What do you want? I'm trying to figure out how they got his little butt in there. You know what I mean? Right. So I'm struggling with this. I'm struggling with it. 
So me and him arguing back and forth because I figured he was only about this big. I could take him. You know what I'm saying? I said, now, I might not be able to beat up a lot of people, but I could take him. You see what I'm saying? And I told him that. You know, keep asking me what I want, uh, little man, and I'll see you at closing. So then we get up to the next window. She want my money. So then that. 1085, 1085. What? I, what do you want my, why are y'all sweating me? So I get to the next window. He pushing bags. I'm pushing them right back in there. So we tussling. See, this is why I don't do drugs. See, I know I'm an alcoholic. First night I went to jail that night. Officer comes because somehow or the other, my start car just stopped at that window where I was pushing the bags back and forth and I don't know what happened, so they called the police because it was all backed up, you know, traffic into the street, and they called the police, and he came and asked me my name, and I told him it was uh, R2-D2, and, uh, you know, and they don't take kindly to falsification. So I went to jail, and, uh, uh, you know, so I tell you that, but just to, you know, let you know that uh, drugs and me, we don't particularly get along. I go to jail. Alcohol was my thing. And my friend Rebecca, she had bought a, a, a brown bag over to my house one day. It had two bottles in it. She gave me mine, and she gave me hers and told me that her brother had schooled her in the art of chugging. And some of you are chug. And she said, you turn it up until you just got, can't drink no more. And it was Boone's Farm apple wine. Oh. Y'all crazy. You know, I, I talk at church on a regular basis. When I tell them I drink Boone's Farm Apple Wine, they don't have that kind of reaction. <laughs> but no, you come to an AA conference and mention Boone's Farm. Oh, 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 yeah, yeah. So we all belong. So I drank that alcohol, and I know for, for a fact what happened to me did not happen to my friend Rebecca. And, uh, my looks changed. I didn't budge from the spot that I was at. My hair was no longer red. Freckles began to fly off my face. I turned into somebody that I wanted to be. Not who I was or who I perceived myself to be, but who I wanted to be. I could sing. I could dance, I could talk to people, people thought I was funny, the whole shebang. And I knew, and I hear a lot of people say they didn't want to drink, and some people were able to do things in their lives that I couldn't do drinking. Because just like it talks about in the book, when I put alcohol in my system, alcohol became my master from the very beginning. And all I could do was drink, and I set out to do that. Because I realized anything that could make me feel that good had to be done on a regular basis. And I began to drink. I began to no longer listen to my mother. My mother's illness was beginning to take effect. And all I could do was drink. I couldn't show up for school. I only went to the eighth grade because I drank. The most important thing to me, more so than anything in my life, if I could drink, and if I could drink the way I wanted to, I was all right. And it's the way that I dealt with everything. Couldn't deal with pain. Couldn't deal with life. And I just drank. My dad had got me a, um, a, a job at a recording studio. And uh, I don't know if you're an artist. I am. And you wait for that person to come and say, oh, my God, I just heard you sing, and, and I just happened to have a contract in my back pocket. <laughs> and uh, I was in the a bathroom, and I was singing, and when I came out, this tall gentleman was standing there, and he told me that he could make me famous. He said all I had to do was go to Las Vegas. And so I called a family meeting, and uh, I sat my family down, and I told them, I will be back for you. As soon as I get my Grammy, I shall be here. My father kept things real simple. He just looked at me and said, 
something is wrong with you. (laughs) He kept it real simple. My mother said, Angie, please don't go. And my little sister cried. She said, I don't want you to go. My father said, let her go. Let her go. And I left with this man that I knew absolutely nothing about. And at the age of 18, I was singing in casinos in Las Vegas, a young girl making a lot of money, opening up for some of the biggest stars and having the time of my life, drinking from sunup to sundown. But something amazing began to happen. See, I began to drink and not remember stuff. And I believe before I got to AA that if you drank and you didn't remember what you did, you had a real good time. (laughs) I had no concept of a blackout until I came to AA. I'm a blackout drinker. I'm a woman who has woken up in Rosedale, Virginia, after having been in, in Cincinnati, waking up with a moose hanging over my head, (laughs) snow on the mountains, some white woman coming in in the apron asking me what do I want for breakfast, some guy named Bubba coming in going, I love you. (laughs) And the same thing was happening in Las Vegas. I got toothless guys named Zeb going, but you told me you loved me so much. And I said, you, you know, Zeb, I, I do believe that I told you that, but uh, that's not true. <laughs> and, uh, and so I began to drink, and, 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 and you know, I, just, I started blacking out, and I just couldn't get it together. And I began to lose jobs, and I began to get blacklisted. Because, see, I didn't hear until I got to Alcoholics Anonymous that the first drink was the problem. See, what I always heard was, maybe you shouldn't drink wine. Don't smoke weed before you drink beer. Smoke it afterwards. (laughs) Drink light beer and lose weight. (laughs) Drink three. Stop at three. Three and a half. But nobody ever told me until I got to Alcoholics Anonymous and I began to listen to speakers and I began to listen to people talk. See, I'm the kind of alcoholic that when I got sober, man, I I listened. I was too scared not to. Because if I didn't know anything else when I got to AA, I knew that I was an alcoholic. And and I just, this gentleman became abusive. And he started beating me up on a regular basis. And my parents, they asked me not to go, but I went. You see, because I was searching for that getting famous without having to do any work for it. I wanted to be famous, but I didn't want to work for it. And when that gentleman said that he could could do that for me, I left with him. He could have had ten bodies in his trunk. All I cared about was that one day I was going to be famous. And I became famous in Las Vegas, but not for what you think. (laughs) Not for what you think. This gentleman had a heroin habit and introduced me to shooting heroin intravenously. One night he came and told me that he needed me to drive. He was going into uh, the store to get cigarettes, and I drove him to the store. And he went in, and he shot and killed the owner and robbed him. And when he came out, He had blood all over him. And I said, what did you do? He said, just drive. And they ended up catching us blocks away. And so what it seemed like to me, y'all, was that I picked up a drink of alcohol at the age of 13. Now I'm on trial for murder. Some people can tell you when they drink what's going to happen. I can't tell you what's going to happen. I'd like to be able to tell you what's going to happen, but I can't tell you what's going to happen. So I sit through this trial, and I listen to this man's family tell me what type of person I was. And it didn't even seem real to me. Then his daughter talked. It just didn't seem real. Because when I drank alcohol that first time, I no longer had a call or a shot on my life. 
I never went after that point was able to say what it was that I was going to do. This gentleman is still in jail as we speak. And here I am in Nashville at an Alcoholics Anonymous conference. Now, I don't know. I don't know why God works the way that he does. But I'm so thankful that he watched out for me. You just don't know how thankful I am that he watched out for me. Because left to my own devices, I'd be dead. Left to my own devices. So the governor gives me a floater out of the state of Nevada, which means and says, as long as you are black <laughs> and you will not change colors, may you never come back to Nevada. No problem. And I left Nevada, and I went back to Cincinnati. And I told my family, that's it. I'm done. I'm ready to get my life together. One of the reasons why when I hear that people drink again, I don't really give them a hard time. Because every single time that I said I was going to stop, I meant it from the bottom of my heart. I just didn't know that I had this thing called alcoholism, but I meant it every time. And see, the one thing that my family had a hard time with is that they had a hard time with the fact that it was just words to them. But man, I meant it. I meant it. But to the untrained eye, we appear liars. I didn't want to drink. I didn't want to drink. I wanted to get my life together. And it lasted me all of two weeks. We were riding on the bus, my brother and sister and I, on the city bus in Cincinnati on Sundays. They used to have this thing called Sunday Pass Riding, and you could ride the bus, city bus, all over town for free. And we drove all over the road, all over the place, and we got to a corner of Liberty and Vine in Cincinnati. And it's not a pleasant place. But when I looked out the window, there was pimps at this restaurant in the parking lot, Cadillacs and Lincoln. They were listening to Shaft on their little eight tracks. You see. And I remember my little sister looked over there and she said, boy, you couldn't pay me to go over there. And my brother going, shoot, me neither. And I'm sitting there thinking, I'm going over there tomorrow. <laughs> and I started riding this bus downtown on a regular basis. Drinking at the worst of bars. Just drinking. One night I was shooting dope. Somebody shot ice water into my veins. By this time in my story, I am living on the river in a housing boarding house for wayward women. And they shot this water into my veins, and it's the closest thing to death that I ever felt. And all the way, it was 17 blocks from where I was at to where I lived. And every step that I took, I just saying, God, please. I don't want nobody to find me like this. I don't want to die like this. I'm a believer in angels. I need to tell you that every circumstance or adversity that I came up upon, there was always somebody there. And I get down to this house, and there's this little uh, blonde woman standing there, and she sees me. I'm sick, and I'm sweating, and she says, you do not have to keep living like that. She went up to my room with me, and she put a washcloth on my head, and she began to tell me of her drinking. And she asked me if I would go someplace with her. And at that time, I would go someplace with anybody. She took me to my first meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. It was in a clubhouse, and uh, it was a nice day, and it was about 200 Harleys parked out front, and a whole bunch of white people with white cups, and, uh, and I thought, well, this is going to be one heck of a party right here. Bikers and white cups, that's all I need. And uh, the clubhouse is called Oak Street. And I'm walking up the sidewalk, and everybody's saying, welcome. And I thought, and they friendly, too. <laughs> Everybody said, welcome, welcome. And then I'm getting ready to go up the steps, and this big biker guy grabs me, picks me up. He goes, welcome to AA. My name is Squirrel. <laughs> I said, man, if you don't put me down, and why they name your big butt Squirrel? 
And she took me into this room in Oak Street and she said, some guy's getting ready to tell his story. I said, okay. So I sat down and people began to gather in and weird. They all gathered and it seemed to me like they all, you know, rose and sat like a choir. And I thought, well, now this is interesting. Then they prayed. I said, goodness. Uh, they pray here. Then some guy got up and told his story. I was appalled. I could not believe that he was telling y'all his business like that. I couldn't. I mean, I thought that was the worst thing. And then y'all bust out laughing. Like, ah, 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 everything he said. Ah, 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 ah. And I thought, they just laughing at this man and he don't even know it. So I felt so sorry for him, you know. So he talked about sleeping on the bridge. <laughs> so I, I just, I, and I killed my wife. <laughs> and I said, man, these white people are crazy. You, you be afraid, sister. So afterwards she says, you know, we go and thank the speaker. I said, well, good, because I got a couple questions I want to ask her. So I get up there to him, and he reaches his hand out, and he goes, you welcome. Welcome to Alcoholics Anonymous. So I pulled him close to me. I said, look here, brother. You know your buddy's laughing at you, don't you? He goes, excuse me? Say, your buddies. You know, all these people that bought t- tickets to come and see you. They're all laughing at you, man. They ain't your friends. And he goes, oh, sugar baby, you just come back. I said, oh, no, you keep coming back. I just heard your story. Now, I don't know much about this, but it's kind of clear to me that you might need to be here. (laughs) So I stayed around Alcoholics Anonymous for a little while, not really ever quite believing that I was like you. You know, I had some issues, true enough, but, you know, the big A word, I didn't know about that. So I stayed around AA, militant, mad, everything was because I was black. You know, if you didn't get my coffee on time at the coffee bar, I'd be standing in the middle of the coffee bar going, it's because I'm black, ain't it? (laughs) That's why I can't get my black coffee, because I'm black. And my sponsor, she's from England, and she would say, would you sit down? I said, well, you know, I got to let it be known what's happening up in here. (laughs) Yeah. I said, as a matter of fact, I'm going to need to talk to you uh, with this little sponsorship thing we're talking about. You know, you being white and me being black, I'm a little sensitive all with civil rights and all. You know, and my my ancestors were slaves. And she said, really? (laughs) She goes, what slave do you know? I was like, well, I don't know none personally, but that's what they told me. She said, "When I'll tell you what you do. She goes, you go through the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, and if you can show me in that book where it says that I can't sponsor you because you're black. I was like, no problem. So I started reading. Doctor's opinion, white people stuff. Bill's story, who's Bill? <laughs> Here lies a Hampshire Grinner. What the hell's a Hampshire Grenadier? Okay. How it works. No. Hmm. A vision for you. Would it be in there? No, it wouldn't. It was in the back of the book, in the story, where this African American woman went to a conference, and she was the only black woman there. And in her story, she said, they never treated me any differently. That's what she wanted me to see. Newcomers. If your sponsor tell you to read something in the book because you done said something stupid, it ain't in there. It ain't in there. You know what they want you to do? They want you to read the book. So they tell you to find something. See, they're smarter than we are. They want you to find something. They tell you, just read the book. Just start at the beginning. And then you looking, keep going back, searching. But it worked. It wasn't in there. 
But the bottom line was that she's my sponsor and has been my sponsor for the last 15 years. And, uh, and, and I love her because uh, she's one of those women who weren't intimidated by me. You know, like when I told her, I said, you know, uh, you got to watch how you talk to me, uh, white lady, because uh, I've hurt people. She goes, I know, I know, the knockout queen, I know. Ooh. <laughs> you scare me. Ooh. And I was like, you know, this relationship ain't going to really last long, I can tell right now. So I'm in AA, and, you know, they start, I know they ain't got none in Nashville, but they start coming into AA with this little crack problem. I know y'all don't have it here. I know Nashville's free of crack. God bless you. In Cincinnati, it's an issue. So all these people are coming into AA. All of them weighed the same thing. I said, do y'all stop smoking this stuff, all of y'all the same day? And then you say, let's go get some help. So they start coming in. Oh, I'm AA. I told them, oh, no, we can't have that. This is Alcoholics Anonymous. Maybe they'll come up with a Crackaholics Anonymous. <laughs> but this is Alcoholics Anonymous, and this is all we deal with here. So you can stay in the building, but go over there and sit at that round table. I'll be with you in a minute, and I'll sponsor all of you. <laughs> and I was brutal. Brutal. They wanted to go to the bathroom. I said, hey, eyes, their eyes was like this. They said, Miss Angie, can I go to the bathroom? Yeah, hurry up. They be in there 10 minutes. I'd be at the door. What you doing in there? Come on out now. You're going to use. Come on out. And I'm telling you this to tell you this. I'm telling you for a reason, because what I've learned in my sobriety is that any time I stand in judgment of any person, place, thing, or situation that I've just wrote my meal ticket to experience it on some level in my life. And I was so mean to those people. But see, instead of trying to explain to them what Alcoholics Anonymous was, I explained what it wasn't. And thank God for the old timers when I came in, when in the last six months of my, 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 uh, my using and my drinking, that all I could see was just those. Thank God for those old timers that talked to me and explained to me singleness of purpose as opposed to dogging me in a meeting. I'm so thankful for AA the way it was when I came in. When the only requirement for membership was the desire to stop drinking. And if you had that desire, and if you had that desire, people leaped out to help. Because see, I got sober June the 20th, 1991. And I'm here to tell you that when I was out there, because I, I didn't stay in when I came. Here's the tricky part, newcomer. Here's the tricky part about alcoholism. I stayed around AA on some level knowing that I had some drinking issues, but never, never would I ever say that I was an alcoholic because, you see, I was raised up with Mr. Trouble back home. Mr. Trouble drank, and they carried him home at the end of the night. My daddy would tell me, Mr. Mr. Trouble's an alcoholic. You see him with the brown jacket on, dirty, drinking out of a bottle? That's an alcoholic. So when I came to AA and you guys told me that you were alcoholics, that's how I visioned you. Like at one point, all of y'all had on trench coats, I guess. <laughs> but I only knew what I knew. So I'm, I'm, I'm not quite believing it. And one day, <laughs> wasn't a cloud on the horizon. I was sitting at the... Um, the uh, meeting and, and decided that, you know, it happened in 30 minutes. I decided that I had been here long enough and surely somebody could use my seat. And I called my sponsor and I thanked her for the sponsorship university that she went to and uh, told her that I was going to leave AA. And it wasn't that I was going to drink. It's just I didn't need to come no more. So I took my big book and then I realized since I had been coming to meetings telling y'all that uh, I was uh, here, that surely you want to know if I was leaving. So I went to the Wednesday night, 8.30 meeting, and they asked if it was any AA-related announcement. (laughs) 
old timer say, Angie, I said, uh, look here, uh, people. Thank you very much for the really big book and, uh, you know, the live and the live and keep it simple and all that stuff. But I'm going to roll on up out of here. I appreciate everything. And I hope that y'all realize that drinking is bad for you. <laughs> then this old timer, you know how sensitive they are. He going to stand up and say, well, get out of here then. There's people trying to stay sober. You get out. I said, dag, old man. Okay. And I left. But what I realized, see, y'all was talking about God was using you as an instrument. God was using me as an instrument too. And God was using me as an instrument to go and find black people and bring them into Alcoholics Anonymous. So I took my big book and I left and I said, the first African-American I see staggering drunk or showing any signs or characteristics, I was going to carry the message of Alcoholics Anonymous. So I get on the city bus going downtown. A brother gets on, staggering a little bit. I slid over next to him. I said, look here, brother, uh, you been drinking? He said, yeah, I had a little something, something. I said, you know, you might be an alcoholic. <laughs> so he started cussing me out. And, uh, and, and so I told him that, uh, you know, the people from the double A club told me you would probably react like this to my information. So therefore, I'll have to give it to you in the only way that I know how. So I turned to chapter five in the book. And I read it as I had been taught by my forefathers. I said, rarely <laughs> did you hear what I said? I said, rarely have we seen a person fail who has thoroughly followed our path. <laughs> I said, those who not recover are constitutionally incapable of being honest with themselves. There are some unfortunate they are not at fault. <laughs> and the bus driver said, oh, hell no. <laughs> he said, you got to get off this bus. <laughs> so I got off the bus. I told him he was an alcoholic, too. And, and I headed on downtown to the bar where I knew it was some black drunks. And I walked in, and they were dancing, having a good old time. They dancing, singing. I went over, and I pulled the plug out the jukebox, and... And I told him, I said, black alcoholics, they got a place for you. It's called the Double A Club. They will help you. They said, well, what you doing down here? I said, oh, no, I'm finished. Now I got to come out and help y'all. That's what the, the uh, Steps uh, 27 says. <laughs> so I'm down here in, in this bar trying to help people with my book when suddenly the thought crossed my mind. Y'all know it. It's more about alcoholism. Suddenly the thought crossed my mind. Just like dude in the book. Dude in the book said, suddenly the thought crossed my mind that surely I could put some whiskey in my milk. I sensed that I was not being a bit too smart. That was me. I sensed I wasn't being a bit too smart. But I looked at the bartender. I said, uh, uh, sugar baby, give me a, a shot of gin. She said, oh, Angie, come on. You ain't drank in a... Girl, give me a shot of G. And they, I graduated. And I took that shot of G. And 45 minutes later, I was in a crack house. Me. But I'm going to tell you something. I'm an alcoholic. Ain't no doubt in my mind. But that crack cocaine, whoo! Every time I see a sugar cube, I just... June the uh, 20th, 1991, and I was looking like the club. I'm down to 85, 90 pounds. My hair ain't been combed. My hair is matted to my head. I haven't had a bath in weeks. And everything that you guys said to me was going to happen, happen. You told me that it would get worse, never better. And I came back properly horrified and thoroughly convinced that I can't drink. And that one leads to the other for me. And I came back and I called my sponsor and I said, will you sponsor me again? She said, I, I absolutely will. But things was different this time for me. Things were different because I was properly horrified and thoroughly convinced that I can't drink alcohol. And I began to go with my sponsor to conferences. 
And I used to sit and I would look at people like Lou and Cliff and you know what I mean? And I would think, man, I wish I could do that. Maybe one day God will see fit. Because they just talked with a fever about AA. And they talked about AA with a love. And I wanted that so desperately. And I came back and I just started doing what my sponsor told me to do. No gummer. It says our book is meant to be suggestive only. Look, they telling you what to do. <laughs> they telling you what to do. Thank God. She didn't go, I suggest, you know, that maybe should you, you know, want to go to a meeting. My sponsor wasn't like that. She told me what to do and I needed that. Because I didn't know how to live life on life's terms. I was clueless. All I knew was anger and that everything was about I was black. And I began to go on these conferences and then she took me in and she started having me go on the institution meet. She had me look at that first, second, and third step. We did that third step in the, in the room at Oak Street on our knees. And for the first time in a long time, I just felt like it was going to be okay. And then in that room, she laid the book out and she showed me the four steps. She did not tell me when I felt like having it done. She gave me a date when it needed to be done. And I did it. And when we did my fourth and fifth step, we also did six and seven. She told me, I don't want you to work on nothing. Don't you work on nothing. I want you to say this prayer every morning when you get up. And every day today, I still say, my creator, I am now willing that you have all of me, good and bad. I pray now that you remove every single defect of character that stands in the way of my usefulness to you and my fellows. Then she had me make this list. The list. And, 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 and if you knew, do this stuff in order because I'm telling you, you do it out of order, you might get a beat down. Because I went to my sister because I had stole all the meat out of her freezer and set up a meat stand. <laughs> and and, uh, and, and she, she beat me up. So when I got out of the hospital, I started listening to my sponsor. And I began to make those amends. And let me tell you, I had a daughter and a son in that process also, who I gave up for adoption. I had my son in prison. And my parents came and got him. And they said that they would raise him. And I had a daughter that I gave up in another state. And my mother and my father said, Angie, bring her home. We'll take care of her because I, I just, I couldn't take care of her. And when I got sober, people were telling me, get your, get your child, get your, get your son, get him. But you know what? For the first time, I knew that I had to make a decision that wasn't based on me. And I said, I'm not going to get him. I'm going to leave him with my parents. And at three years sober, my parents told me that they would, like it if I would not come around so that my children would not be confused. And I said, yes. I said, I won't come around. But y'all, I have to tell you, I was at my kid's soccer game. I was at my son's basketball game. And I was dressed in disguise, but I was there. Because some old timers shared with me that I was connected to my children spiritually and that there was nothing that anybody could do to take that away. And I began to go and see them. You don't know how hard it was not to go and just put my arms around them and tell them how much I love them. I need to tell you that my daughter is 19 years old. And she called me on her 18th birthday. And she said, I want to see you. And I went in my, I met my daughter. And I was able to clean off my side of the street with her. I was able to tell her how much I loved her. And it wasn't that I didn't love her. I gave her up because I did. My son called me on his. Oh, yeah. And my daughter's dating a white guy. <laughs> Ha <laughs> 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 
<laughs> My daughter is uh, attending uh, Grambling State University in Louisiana. And my son, he wants to be a rapper. <laughs> but he's going to the school of court reporting, and he's at the top of his class. It ain't about nothing I did. God is good. God is good. Um, I told you I wasn't educated when I got here. I, uh, I'm in college at the University of Cincinnati. I got four more classes and I graduate. Changed my major and I uh, will be getting my uh, bachelor's in psychology with a focus on all addiction. And uh, my life is great, you guys. Nobody could have told me. If you'd have told me that I'd be where I am right now, I'd have never believed it. I'd have never believed it. To be a part of this thing, that's why I tell you that the buck stops here for me. You guys get me. You guys get how I think. You just get me. Nobody else gets me the way that you do. When they called me and asked me to speak at the International, blew me away. Dude called from New York and he said, we just heard your CD and we'd like for you to open up at the International Convention. And I thought it was my friend Tony, so I was like, man, quit playing on my phone, man. <laughs> I said, Tony, don't call me no more. And he goes, ma'am, this is so-and-so from uh, World Services. So I figured I better go in my bedroom and look at the caller ID. <laughs> and I did, and it said New York. And I was like, oh, dude, my bad, my bad, big time. I said, what you want, man? And he said, uh, we want you to speak to the international. I said, do you know who you're talking to? He said, yeah, I know who I'm talking to. And, uh, and I went and I spoke, and it was a life-changing experience. How do you get from being homeless, a homeless drunk, to talking in front of 55,000 people? How do you get there? God is good all the time. And uh, I remember I walked out there and, and I looked out and I couldn't see anybody. And then I turned around and I looked up and it was like the big, I had the biggest head I had ever seen in my <laughs> life. It was amazing. It was just, it was just awesome. It was just awesome. And, uh, and I've been traveling and, and, and having a time of my life and, and doing what I feel to be God's work for me. And, uh, but a long time ago back home, my grandmother used to sing this song and, uh, y'all mind? And uh, I think it, uh, it tells the story. <clears throat> and I'll close with this. Amazing grace How sweet the the sound that saves a wretch like me. See, I was, was lost. But now I'm, I'm found. 
I was blind, but now I see. God bless. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.